quickly to our second speaker, uh, Elizabeth Shaw from Lancaster University. Um, I just want to remember that she is author with uh, other colleagues uh, of a book um, published in, in 2007 uh, titled The Design of Everyday Life, uh, which is partially uh, the starting point. Uh, this is the cover already on the screen uh, of the book. Um, of the work she will present today. Uh, she is also has published recently a um, book uh, with other two colleagues uh, about uh, titled the dynamics of social practices where which is more focused on this uh, this reflection um, which characterized the the, um, uh, the work of Elizabeth about the concept of practice uh, Anna a work, an analytical also work uh, on the idea of practice. So I'll let you, thank you. Then we will get, we'll get questions for both presentation altogether. Is that on now? Yeah. Uh, well, it's really nice to be here and really nice to have the opportunity in a way to look back a little bit. The Design of Everyday Life book was a few years ago now and think about kind of where I stand in relation to those ideas. But in particular, in this context, to work through, I think, what was discussed in that book, which are points of intersection between the different fields of design, STS, and consumption. So I'm going to kind of run through some ideas which I think can be taken forward in a way. It builds on the kind of history of these fields. But these are um, still unfinished business. These are points of connection. Um, and cross-fertilisation, and I think this is where there's some really new work to be done, um, and some of that's going on in this conference. But if you look at the kinds of traditions of the sociology of consumption, and also I would say material culture in a way here, then there are all kind, there's a tradition of thinking about objects in a kind of symbolic sort of way. Um, certainly issues about uh, acquisition more than use perhaps. This is very simple, but I think it, it kind of helps to, to set the scene. In science and technology studies, there are, again, many tra sort of um, tracks and strands, but issues about objects and innovation and stabilization, scripting and so on, are very well documented. The project that, uh, and the book was also with a product designer, and so this was really a conversation between us. And in looking at theories of product design, then there's a lot of kind of emphasis on the, on the object and the qualities of the object and also on kind of user studies. And I think none of these fields um, kind of really match, ma mesh together terribly well. And so the argument in the book, and today a bit, is that we need to stand outside of those to look for the connections and that kind of social theories of practice provide a way of making those uh, new connections and generating different ways of thinking about the relationship and the interaction between objects, not alone, but lots of objects together, and even infrastructures, uh, people, and practices. So I'm going to kind of explore ways of thinking, of, like what topics come from mashing up together these different traditions. And I'm going to illustrate it with a variety of different sort of practical examples, home improvement, do it yourself as a field, digital photography, which now looks rather quaint and old fashioned, like when digital photography was new, it's actually not many years ago, but there's some interesting transformations there where um, the kind of elements of photography were completely reconfigured in a very short space of time. I'm going to talk a bit about plastic. Um, when we looked at material cultural studies, one of the striking omissions was anything to do with the material, despite the title. But actually thinking about material itself is, was key for the designers and can be key and has been a bit key for science studies. So um, those kind of three examples allow me to explore um, a number of kind of points of intersection which still, as I say, deserve uh, more work. And I'll end with some comments on actually the job of design and product design in those, in those fields. So I'm going to start with like the really, really um, easy cases, which is the sort of observation about where does competence lie does competence in the capacity to do, um, does that lie with the human or the non-human? And there's a, I mean, this is, this is the really easy starting point, um, that the notion of hybrids imply that the hammer alone is no good, the hand alone is no good. Uh, actually, hammering depends on the two together. And 
in a slightly more elaborate way, uh, but in a way that needs to be picked up in design studies. It means that focusing on the user is basically a mistake. I mean, it's, it sort of assumes that the competence lies in the person, not the object, not the thing. And at a very minimum level, science studies has said, well, competence is this kind of emergent arrangement that is not part of the object or the user. The user, in a way, is not a sensible concept if you're interested in those kinds of hybrids. So that's one contribution or one point of difference and departure. And, but that's sort of as far, I mean, it's a bit crude to say that's as far as science studies has gone. But if you then say, well, what does this mean for, like, the sociology of consumption? You have to push this idea a little bit further and say, um, how does this hybrid arrangement of competence matter for in a way, the details of everyday life and for what people do. So here's one also simple example um, drawn from the field of home improvement and, and do it yourself. This is a tin of varnish. And not so many years ago, actually putting a good surface of varnish on a door, for example, really you would have to take the door off the hinges to lie it flat because the varnish would drip and you'd have all kinds of problems if you didn't do that. You had to be quite good the skill was embodied in the person, the varnish. If you did it the first time you did it, you were almost sure to make a mess of it. Okay. It's a really skilled job. Not now. So in a way, this tin of varnish, it's dry in 20 minutes. You can recoat it in two hours. You can be pretty much an idiot, and you'll still get a relatively good finish on the door. You certainly don't have to take the door off the hinges. So what's happening here is the competence that was in the person, in the varnisher, is now in the tin exactly as a kind of science studies hybrid kind of argument would lead you to believe. But there's more to it than that. Actually, that's brought the job of doing varnishing, of home improvement, into the, the realm of capacity of many more people. This move has intervened in, in the economy. Okay? It means that systems of competence have the boundary of competence between the person and the thing moves, and, and as that boundary moves, so does the kind of idea of what people can do for themselves, do it yourself, or when they would hire an expert in. So this image suggests that basically the skill embodied in the person, the kind of red block, um, that was old varnishing, where you needed to be quite clever, and the skill embodied in the varnish, there was sort of still some there, um, but basically you would really want um, to, to know what you were doing, and if you, if you wanted a good door and you didn't know what you were doing, you'd be better off not doing it yourself, the don't do it yourself kind of thing. You'd be better off hiring an expert. So the point, this very simple point here with a very simple example, is that these kinds of interventions are interventions in systems of provision, in the economy, in the business, in this case of kind of professional painters and decorators, but obviously this is an example that would apply in all kinds of other areas. Um, so these hybrids are about consumption and production as well. That's just one tin of varnish. That's just one object. If you continue with the example, um, you see that we need to go beyond single objects and think about entire projects that people are willing to take on themselves and begin to think not just about using one object, but about the whole kind of practice of doing, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about later. But sticking with our kind of work on home improvement, um, one thing that, that was sort of uh, interesting is that this is, a, this is plastic plumbing uh, fitting. And this plastic system enabled uh, the person we spoke with to begin to contemplate actually moving a radiator, which normally would have been a, like if you get that wrong you've got a big problem, you've got water all over the place and you can't, you know, so you really, this is a boundary, it's a bit like electricity, people are often not willing to go that far, they varnish the door but not do the plumbing, not do the rewiring. But this intervention, an entire system of plastic plumbing, meant that actually a new area of home improvement fell into the realm of possibility um, and the confidence from doing this project then led this person to think, OK, I can tackle not just one moving a radio, I can take on whole new jobs. Um, the competence that that person had extended much beyond the plastic plumbing. Uh, they acquired a whole toolbox 
And these tools are the kind of residue of, of past projects, but they also enable future projects. And obviously tools are really interesting in this case because they're not about one job, not just the hammer, but uh, the whole collection is a kind of um, history of an accumulation of competence, not one intervention at a time, but over a life course. Um, of course, there's also a story of failure, but we're dealing here with a kind of narrative that goes, yes, over many years um, and over many different projects. So we're leaving behind the kind of STS concern with individual objects or material arrangements. We're dealing with social histories of people and with social histories of competence. This finally, in this case, um, led to the kind of need to acquire more consumer goods um, this person who did move the radiator then took on this job of building an, a, like a Wendy house for their children and that meant acquiring somewhat new skills but also a whole lot of new goods. So again there's a kind of a connection to the economy of acquisition which is happening here. So here we've got the simple story of hybrids and competence leading into the field of consumption studies and leading in a way into the capacity of people and what they do and don't do and where is, where is the economy in that. The second theme is where I'm going to kind of pick up new possibilities of um, thinking about material objects and social practices and in particular the idea that social practices are made of ongoing configurations of elements. This takes us beyond the kind of science studies uh, preoccupation with the material um, and into a kind of world which has a different social history. Social theories of practice kind of have a, a different a lineage. But here's an observation from Andreas Reckwitz, who's saying social practices, and in a way we're talking about kind of 1984 Giddens kind of idea of social practice as the main topic of social research and social theory and social inquiry. Reckwitz is here saying, in very simple terms again, that social practices like digital photography or showering or whatever, consist of a kind of ongoing integration between three elements. And I've used the primary colours here to kind of indicate those three elements. The picture in the middle, where the dots are joined, is, is where to start in a way. So the blue represents the material world, the yellow is the kind of world of meaning, and the red represents the competence. So doing those DIY projects involves a kind of ongoing and continual interaction between mere material competence and the kind of meaning, the idea of the project. So that's the basic starting point. But clearly, clearly here, what matters is this kind of, is the role of elements and how the history of objects fits into this ongoing dynamic of integration. So the picture uh, on the, where the dots are broken is especially interesting. That suggests that in the kind of ongoing life of practices, links are constantly being made and broken between different elements of that practice. So in a way, we're surrounded by, by things that have lost their role in everyday life, uh, designed objects that have fallen out of use. And the photography example lets me kind of go into that in a bit more detail. So what happened in the shift between film photography and digital photography? Uh, there are some areas of continuity, certainly in the kind of element of meaning, the idea of what makes a good photograph, like not with the feet cut off and with the head still in view and the kind of people in the, in the, in the centre and so remain, that kind of aesthetics remains very, very constant. But how to take that picture, the material elements of that have obviously changed beyond recognition. So this kind of dusty old film camera, even buying film now is quite a hard thing to do. This thing has gone, into the cup, gone back into the cupboard. It's left the field of, of kind of technologies in action. Um, the digital camera has come into view. And in terms of the language of sort of this element theory of practice, we can, this is sort of represented that same point in the, in the red, yellow and blue uh, imagery. So the kind of film photography retains, there's a point of crossover in the kind of element of meaning. Um, but there are new tools with digital photography, relatively new, actually they're pretty established now, and some new kinds of skills. But again, I think thinking about the ongoing dynamics of social practice means that we can't, we have to move away from both the design studies and the, to some extent the STS kind of focus on objects. And remember that social practices are 
kind of um, multiply connected. And in this case, doing photography involves digital photography, involves new relationships between skills that were transferred from using a computer to photography. You don't actually need to know about light and dark. You can just use Photoshop. But that involved drawing competence from a totally another field carried through this new assembly, um, multiple assemblies of all sorts of different material and software kinds of elements. And so here, we, where does science studies or material culture or consumption theory fit into this? Not very well. It's only dealing with little tiny bits of this kind of ongoing picture. And it's not either dealing terribly well with the kind of point I was making earlier through the example of DIY, which is about the kind of um, carriers of the practice, the lives of people who are the integrators of these elements. And so we can add to this kind of um, narrative in a way that's building up by realizing that the way in which, I've called them carriers, um, certainly not users, and that's a big conceptual difference. Uh, these are the people who do photography are the carriers of practice in social practice theory terms. They kind of keep the practice alive and they keep it changing. So the way in which us as photographers integrate the elements is part of making photography and changing it all the time. So it's quite clear when you kind of understand or learn about how people take, take photographs that there are kind of big divides. Some people just kind of the digital camera just occupied the place in their photographic careers of a film camera that was just learning a few, new, a few new tricks. In a way, the elements were faithfully reproduced as best they could, but not for others. For other people, um, using the digital photography meant all kinds of new possibilities, messing around with pictures and so on. So just to give a few examples, one from Florence. Um, this is somebody just using a completely classic tourist photograph of Florence Cathedral being taken here, but with a digital camera. And here's somebody really having fun with the kind of new possibilities. The sky was never that red. And here's another opportunity where the photographic family album is being reviewed in a completely new kind of, kind of way. Now, these processes are about, um, as I said, also breaking links. So new practices is about engineering new connections but it's also, and simultaneously, about breaking old connections. So here's a picture of some um, stranded elements, material elements, of practices that used to exist but don't exist anymore. Now, you have too big an audience to actually let me ask you what you think these objects are, but we can discuss that in the questions if you like. Um, some of them I think you just simply won't know. In other words, the links have been broken so long ago that these things, we don't, we don't know even how we would use them or what they were used for. And film is heading, perhaps, in that direction. So we've gone from the competence thing and the project kind of thing to focusing on the ongoing dynamics of the role of materials in um, the changing lives of practices. Now then, I said, and this is where we kind of get a little bit closer to some of the design discussions, that we had a kind of uh, product designer on the team. And so he was saying, well, what about materials? You know, where's materials? As, as designers, we are interested in wood and plastic and steel and so on. I mean, this is all about what do you science studies people have to say about materials? And so actually, that was quite challenging in a way. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, just to open a field, which I think is still needs to be opened further, about um, actual materiality from a bit material culture studies and a bit science studies, uh, but to think more about the relation between bounded objects and the materials of which they're made. And plastic is actually a good example, not for sustainability reasons, but because it has been written a bit about in the kind of history of materials and science studies, but also demonstrates brilliantly this kind of multiple intersections between materials and many different practices and, and many different objects. So um, there's some quite nice, uh, relatively, well, 1961 um, accounts of, of the future of plastic, of the great optimism of plastic as a material in transforming everyday life. And the optimism was to do with how many different objects could be, I mean, plastic itself is a very complicated and not one category, but it is in this account. Um, so this is a kind of idea where uh, many practices could be kind of infiltrated by plastics which would enable um, 
new social arrangements to go on and new kinds of substitutions to happen uh, in the way that you can see here. So wonderful uh, possibilities of dirt-proof windows and um, silent, dustless floors and, and so on. And it's just this kind of narrative about a kind of life of plastic goes right through to death with plastic. And so um, this is the kind of old age of plastic person or plastic man um, with a coffin being, being the kind of last stage of this life. But a life lived in a world, and it's interesting here, this is really makes the point about replacement. And I mean, what is plastic? Plastic is not moth, because pre-plastic was wool. Plastic is not rust, because pre-plastic was metal. Plastic is full of colour, because pre-plastic was a kind of more monochrome world. So plastic is always being defined in relation to what went before. And in a kind of... I mean, V.B. Barker has written, written very nice work on um, the kind of uh, history of Bakelite in particular. Um, but but classic, classically, in a kind of way, you're like, how did the material come to be? sort of just so stories in Kipling's sense of um, how things came to be. But without this kind of ongoing relationship to what was pushed out of the frame uh, in the process. So we get histories of different kinds of materials. Um, but I think this kind of way of thinking from innovation studies doesn't quite get to the point of this relation between materials and artefacts or doesn't, doesn't really get to what is the dynamics of material culture focused on the, on the kind of material. And it is definitely complicated because focusing on the material is, a, is a, like a useful thing to do but also a stupid thing to do because you never encounter plastic in its pure... What is pure plastic? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You only ever encounter it in all of these and many other forms. And so plastic is, you know a power socket. Plastic is a telephone, a hairbrush, a hairdryer, buttons, uh, television, surrounds all. These are all Bakelite, actually. Um, but, so there's something um, elusive, and this is also where the kind of design role comes in, between this kind of material and object relationship. And I think uh, the performance of the material is both object-specific, but equally the material is made the idea of what plastic is good for comes from nothing other than this multiplicity of material object relations. So, so we were kind of saying to the designers, well, what are you talking about, material? You know, is it a sensible concept to think about when it's actually being made through these different kinds of uh, uses? And in particular, um, I mean, here's a sort of nice example from everyday life, uh, which is a reminder of not only the relation between, so this is a plastic washing up bowl, which is different from the enamel um, or the metal that existed before, but it's also about the process of doing washing up, which again is not kind of... Um, here is a nice ex silent experience without the rattling of the, of the crockery. So these kinds of ideas, I think, push on to say, well, we need, in thinking about material culture, we need to think about relative qualities, we need to think about defects and properties and performances as they made real through specific um, artefacts. But equally, it's that multiplicity of artefacts that kind of um, make the emerging properties of the material, make it good for insulation, make its cost, make, it, make its colour. Now, these aren't questions, that, I mean, as far as I know, that have been hugely important um, in either in material culture or in a way in science studies or in a way in design. But they have been picked up a little bit more in the kind of field of, of consumption and, again, the kind of economy. So there, there's a lovely book about nylon um, raising and uh, addressing the issues that these kind of synthetic materials had the effect uh, kind of, of democratising the idea of a wardrobe, of, of clothing that you could, you could change or have a variety of clothing. And it really entered everyday life in that way um, because uh, the, it's sort of... The, the price of individual garments changed, the variety of garments changed, the idea of different colours for different occasions, all kind of connected to this, this product. So it's not one object at a time. That's an important message. I'm just going to do a little few examples that kind of um, blow that apart further, uh, related to a bit more recent work um, 
I'm now working uh, when you're running a centre at Lancaster called the Dynamics of Energy, Mobility and Demand. And so to hook up with the sustainability issues from the previous speaker, we're having to think about kind of consumption, material culture, and in this case, energy. And I think electricity, like if we thought of electricity a little bit like plastic, then electricity is obviously part of enabling many practices at once. There's not one area of daily life which is touched by electricity. Um, oh, shit, I've moved on. Um, uh, because uh, electricity is embedded, that's the blue. Is it material element? I'm not quite sure about that. But electricity is part of kind of cooking, it's part of lighting, it's part of showering. So in kind of technology studies, we need some vocabulary to cope with this kind of both the infrastructures and what flows through infrastructures. We need a whole new vocabulary in a way to realize that um, these kinds of the enabling systems are part of many practices at once. Infrastructures are also um, important because they coexist. And so here's a kind of image, um, just a simple practice like showering depends on the coexistence of electricity, gas and running water. You, it's very hard to do showering without those. And so I think there's been a, there is a kind of limit of focusing on the shower, you know, the shower head or the bathroom, and kind of not paying full attention to the hinterland of material means that enable those practices to go on. And in that sense, the kind of real design, I mean, is electricity, is that designed? Does that make sense to talk about the design of a water infrastructure? Well, sort of yes and sort of no. Um, but I think there's something quite, this is again, um, there have been histories of large technical systems. How did they come to be? Just like the just so stories, but not how are they embedded in practices or how are they embedded in multiple practices or how do they coexist and overlap? So one more on that. Um, but again, kind of using this iconography of practices, um, is to recognise this is an intersection in Broadway, showing that the infrastructures that enable all of these technologies, that enable practices, are laid down historically at different periods. So, you know, you get a kind of period of electrification, which was laid down on top of an existing infrastructure of roads, on top of often uh, other kinds of infrastructures. So, so what, what's possible to do at particular locations depends on the affordance of the objects, the material culture, but also on the infrastructures that enable them. And there's a kind of um, quite important and interesting things about ongoing dynamics of that. This is where design and sustainability lies, not just in recycling or redesigning a few little bits of uh, uh, individual objects. So we got that far. We've got quite a lot of ideas, competence, projects, practices, careers. Uh, multiplicity of relations between materials, some of which existing literatures get us a little bit with, some of them clearly don't. There are all kinds of unanswered questions. But I'm going to finish by saying what this kind of catalogue of ideas might mean for product design, because that was the conversation we started with. So this is a bit of a recapping, but also thinking about where does design fit into this story. And one thing which was really, it still puzzles me actually, is, is what do designers really do? So lots of objects get made, but designers, product designers to sell themselves have to say we do other, we something else, we're adding value in some way. And I think that's a true mystery, like actually what value is being added? Designers have certain kinds of ideas, um, but I think it's interesting to think what is it that design does in relation to material culture and, and the kind of um, role of objects, given the kind of context that I've already explored. So what kind of theory of value do we have? Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a handful to look at. One which is the, absolutely the most dominant is that design is somehow injected, the square, the blue square represents an object, is somehow injected into an object, which becomes better because it's been designed. So designers endow artifacts with specific qualities, and there's all kinds of discussions about what those qualities might be, um, but the kind of issue is, is, some, is, is about that. So the design is some kind of ethereal quality that, that's sort of, yeah, planted into the artifact. And then um, that's, that's one kind of idea, uh, which is quite a kind of powerful role for design and quite a not very powerful role for the object. A second family of ideas about where uh, the role of designers in relation to value is to simply recognise that designers aren't the only actors in town. 
and that so-called users have a big role in shaping the meaning and the value of the designed object. And um, actually, designers perhaps don't have a very unique role. They're just one amongst many other players that are in, involved in this kind of ongoing attributing and taking away of value to objects so the value doesn't last forever. The value of an object changes all the time as these different actors circulate around it add and, and take away meaning. So at a minimum, it means to, to add value or to contribute, designers need to understand these users because they're part of the picture. Huge tradition of, of that kind of way of thinking. Um, but that does, I think, separate the user from the object in the way that I implied was really, really problematic right at the beginning. So another possibility is not either of those two, but the third is that um, uh, in terms of sort of theories of practice, design, designers have a part to play in shaping the blue square now, um, making materials and ideologies and competencies of which social practices are made. In other words, engaging with objects is at the same time engaging with competence and meaning. It's not a separate from that. You can't say, I'm just dealing with an object. That's clear from everything that I've said this far. Um, there's some points of connection there with some of the science studies, recognizing that artifacts are actively configuring experiences of need and desire, images and forms of competence. But for me, the problem is that the science studies has always entered through the blue square. It's never really fully engaged with this kind of ongoing dynamic of the kind of integration that's involved in changing social practices. But it's possible um, to think about design as sort of practice-oriented product design, which is obviously not about the thing, but it's about kind of a uh, form of contribution to the practice. And this takes different forms. So here's two... So a couple of extracts uh, of some very prominent designers saying, well, actually, that's what we do. You know, we're not designing objects. Um, we're doing cell phoning. We kind of intervene, and there's, there's people making businesses out of this kind of idea. Um, but in a way, I think you don't have to push very far to realize that actually they're still making cell phones. They're still, obviously, because that's the thing that's sold, right? Designers are working for companies that are selling things. So they're not quite going as far as is possible to take the practice of photography or cell phoning or showering as the kind of central unit of analysis and intervention. So the last slide is in a way to um, realize that thinking about science studies, material culture and objects is, is in a way a matter of theory above all. And it's about a kind of theory of things and the role of things in everyday life. So if you go along with the view that things have some kind of absolute quality, then you have an idea that designers or somebody provides that quality or adds that value. If you say things are very situationally specific, they change all the time, then maybe design doesn't have a special role, certainly not a unique role alongside all the other kind of processes going on. Uh, if you say, well, the material is an element of social practice, a bit like some STS people do, and a bit like some kind of fancy advanced designers do. Then you say the role of design is about co-producing experience and these kinds of things. Um, if you take the stronger view of social practice, so it's not just an element, but really we're focusing on the, the kind of complete complex, uh, then the theory of things leads you to say, well, any intervention, but it could be in ideology, it could be in competence, it could be in material, these are not really separable. So engaging in this field is somehow having a part in the future of social practice. So the big sustainability story is not about designing objects, it's about intervening. Well, of what, is everyday, what are the practices of everyday life? That's where you would start. What kind of energy, what kind of other material resources are kind of pulled through that system, that's where you would start. And design wouldn't have a very, certainly wouldn't have a role on its own in that. That would be a complete mistake. So that's another point of discussion. I'll finish there. So thank you a lot to both of our guest speakers. Um, both of them uh, 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 um, um, stressed probably two things. One is the complexity of materiality and design in the social experience. Uh, 
from different perspective. And both of them stressed, have stressed the need for a more um, various and uh, um, intersection of tradition, disciplines, concepts, perspectives to study uh, materiality and design in uh, society. So we have, um, before the lunch, we have time for a question or comments from the audience. Uh, we have microphones going around. Yeah, already there. So please, who want to start? Hi, I'm Javier Jimeno from the VU University, Amsterdam. And my question is primarily to Shetil, but also can be extended to Elizabeth. And, it, and it's about this break of traditions in the study of design history. Shetil mentioned that there's now a broader understanding of, the, of design culture in general and the move from the study of objects and persons to intermediaries and institutions. And this is a move that I welcome, of course. Uh, but I'm wondering if it's not that much about the study, the object of study that is different, but about the methodologies that we are applying. So my question is, do we need to choose of uh, between in doing research on mediators and only on mediators and consumers and institutions and not anymore on, on designers and on objects or do we need just to update our methodologies on how to study design including persons and including objects and it's also about the uh, quote from Ben Heimor that, that you were mentioning uh, do we need to choose between the extraordinary and the ordinary, or can we uh, study both the extraordinary and the ordinary as part of, of design today? Thanks. Um, good question. I, I think we must, there must be room for both. I mean, there must be room for study, keep studying objects and designers and you know for whatever reasons as well as uh, studying uh, you know, other areas and actors in design culture um, so I don't think we have to choose but I think the question is more uh, what kind of knowledge are we looking for and what kind of questions do we have to ask in order to produce that knowledge and where do these questions take us and what kind of methodologies do we need to uh, address these issues. So rather than, you know, programmatically uh, saying that we have to abandon something for something else, I think it's more about um, figuring out what we want to know and then choosing the appropriate uh, the objects of study and, and methodologies based on that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, what's the question is the first thing to kind of begin with. Um, and, but, I, but I think there's, it's important to remember that actually there are different theoretical starting points here. And it's not a matter of kind of bringing different traditions together in some seamless way. Um, I mean, I kind of emphasized the different traditions, but it, sometimes they're actually in conflict, and it's important and useful to recognize that. Uh, I mean, which, what's the unit of analysis? I mean, what are you taking as a central topic? I think is the key, is the key thing. Um, and for me, it wouldn't be mediators or consumers or objects. I'm interested in the life of social practices. But that doesn't, for me, lead necessarily into any one method. I can explore that question from a whole variety of different methods, but other people can as well. Yeah. Okay, um, a question for 
uh, Fallon, uh, but be extended. Um, I'm not an historian uh, so of design, so I mainly know your work because of, your, of the use of the concept of script. And so I was quite surprised by the fact that uh, uh, script didn't come out in your uh, presentation, and I was wondering if, um, if script can be an entry point into an history of sustainable design. Also because, for instance, I don't know if you know Yapiesma work about using uh, script in order to design sustainable products. Um, and, and this is also related to what uh, uh, Elizabeth Shaw was saying. Uh, sh she really stressed the, the issue of competencies and uh, from my point of view, script is a very useful uh, tool to describe how competencies are distributed. So, uh, in my opinion, that could be an entry and I was wondering if, if, if for you could be an entry to, into an history of sustainable design. Well, yeah, um, I've you know, written on the relevance of script analysis to, to design studies and design history before, so I didn't want to rehearse that point here. And, uh, well, of course, script analysis is one of a you know, series of SDS concepts and approaches that you know, can be uh, useful in any or in many uh, design historical studies and including uh, history of sustainable design. I mean, you could, you know, think of analyzing objects that are purportedly uh, sustainable and, you know, through the lens of script analysis to explore how and why they are and are not, for instance. But so, yes, it's possible, but it was just not sort of a priority in the more broader framework that I'm, and historiography that I was mapping out now. So. Yeah, it's an interesting observation. Um, for me, I mean, I don't think anybody ever pretended the idea of script would take anybody really very far. I mean, it's quite a bounded little concept and it's quite handy, but it is bounded. So, um, and it, but it does indeed connect some idea of materiality and, and competence in the way that I was talking about. But it doesn't, it is bounded, it doesn't go very far. It wouldn't, wouldn't really help you necessarily explain the emergence of whole new kinds of areas of practice. So I wrote uh, together with Mika a rather strange article on the development of Nordic walking, you know, with the two, two sticks. And the sticks, you could say, force you to walk in a certain way, so that's a nice little case of scripting. Um, but producing the sticks and their scripting didn't make Nordic walking. Nordic, lots more ideas are required to begin to understand how this funny kind of practice entered the field of walking. Who, who picked it up? Who were the carriers of it? How did it relate to existing forms of walking? You know, script can't get you to those parts of the question, which is perfectly fine. Nobody ever said they would. Um, how can we use the idea of script to understand, you know, the development of a society of automobility? That, that doesn't fully work either. Um, so it's a one little interface, but if you're um, kind of interested in the bigger pictures, then you need to remember that's one little interface. This is a question to Elizabeth Schulf. Um, I really like that notion of uh, the carriers of a practice in, as opposed to the user. And uh, recently I read an interesting statement by the British artist uh, David Hockney. I don't know if you're familiar with him. So he became famous as a painter in the 60s. Then he experimented with photography for let's say 30 years and then now he's back into painting since, since 15 years maybe. Yeah. And he argued that all of us, uh, due to the immense spread of the technology of photography and the camera, have learned to look at the world in a way as if we were cameras. So um, I was just wondering where that concept of the carrier of a practice actually stems from and if you could elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, um, I, I agree too. I think it's a really important distinction and it's nice to have the opportunity to expand a bit on that. So um, for me, the, the idea of a carrier, well, 
in sort of more social theory practice, so philosophers like Ted Shatsky or Andreas Reckwitz, who've been writing about I mean, uh, these kinds of ideas, um, work with, sometimes it seems a bit radical, and, and actually it is, it's a bit weird as well, um, but the idea that practice, if you take practices really as the central unit of your analysis and inquiry, you, they, they kind of have a life of their own, and you and me and everybody else in the room, we're merely the carriers. The practice captures us. So we're like just like a host kind of symbiotic, parasitic kind of relationship. So basically the lives of practices depend on them being able to capture enough recruits and followers to keep them alive. And if we stop doing it like we stopped doing film photography, film photography dies and other forms take over. Um, so, so this causes all kinds of problems for ideas of agency and blah, blah, blah. we're captured uh, uh, in that way. Actually, I think it's quite plausible. I don't have any problems with it. Um, but then the, the kind of question, if you flip the kind of ontological kind of picture round that way, you do ask different kinds of questions, like about innovation studies or transitions in material culture. They are, in a way, also part of this capturing by, by practices. I mean, that, that would have to be part of the story. So, um, but that goes back to this sort of competence, like some practices call for specific artifacts and forms of competence to go with them, like that set of four dead images They've died because the, the stuff's there, but not the, not the competence. So the, for the life of a practice, it needs, it needs living bodies. It needs real human beings to keep those links in place so that the practice... There's all kinds of other questions about how practices change. And I mean, there's a whole... Well, the Dynamics of Social Practice book touches, just scrapes the surface of some of those much bigger philosophical and social theory kinds of discussions. But I think they're interesting and they're relevant here, and they certainly mean you could never talk about the user. Yeah. Apologize for my voice. This is Eleonora Lupo from uh, Politecnico Milano, and my question is for Elizabeth. Um, I've been really impressed in the way you framed this idea of distributed knowledge, especially when you claim about this, uh, the skilling persons in respect of infusing the skill in the tools. I make this question because I always work in preserving traditional knowledge like intangible heritage. And in this, in this sector, the human factors and you know that the social practice is really embedded in people. So my final point is, and my final question is, I was inspired by this practice-centered product uh, hmm. or design, but how is recognizable in this method and this approach by who is on the competence at the end because I, I feel I got lost or maybe I missed some point in your talk. Yeah, I'm not completely sure I've got the question but I'll say a few things and then we can pick up the conversation again if I haven't, haven't answered you. Um, competence and knowledge is definitely a tricky area and so the examples I gave, like the chin of varnish and those other things, sort of are a reminder that competence kind of is distributed and circulates through things and so on. Um, but then that does still raise some awkward questions, uh, especially about traditional culture or traditional knowledge, like you say, because um, it's quite possible that knowledge can, and competence can hang around for a long time without the things and without being mobilized and enacted. There can be kinds of reservoirs of knowledge about making fancy biscuits at home, even if nobody is making fancy biscuits at home any longer, and even if one of the devices for that, which was one of the pictures in the slide, is never used at all. So, do, so did the knowledge just go? No, in a way it's there, but dormant or not being 
mobilized or enacted. And this also raises some challenges for theories of practice because you have to imagine that all around us we're surrounded by like the dregs or um, not exactly mobilized forms of competence and knowledge that, that perhaps we individually and in different ways have but aren't, aren't enacting. But that's not really that different to realize that we're surrounded by material objects and, either, and meanings as well that aren't being actively mobilized today. Is that, an aunt, is that addressing a question, or do you want another go? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Enough, yeah. Okay. We, have time. <clears throat> we have time for our last question, then it's lunch time for all of us. Can I? Okay. A question for Elizabeth Shaw. Um, I'm, I was thinking, but Mm, it's possible to consider design or better designing as a very specific practices, maybe not so social, but uh, more related with uh, um, a competence, a professional competence. And what about if we try to uh, study, to analyze uh, designing uh, in, in that way, uh, with three points uh, influencing uh, each other? and uh, reshaping, for example, considering sustainable design. This is the question. Yes, I think um, it, it sort of depends what kind, whether you're interested, so the question goes in two directions. Would it be possible to think of designing itself as a practice, a bit like showering or digital photography or any other kind of practice that you might say? And I'd probably simply say yes. Um, actually, you could do the history of forms of kind of like academic life as practice or, or whatever. And they do involve ongoing integrations of materials, meanings, and competences. So in that sense, this theory of practice is very, very handy because there's more or less no limit to it to the topics to which it can be applied, but of course that's also a problem. I mean, you'd have to go, you'd have to think more about how you studied and understood the life of that practice. But I'll leave it there. Um, designing and sustainability in practice, I think, is a very different kind of question. It's more a question about, like I've got on the picture there, about the role of design in changing or reproducing the sustainability or otherwise of the practices that are enacted around designed objects. So it's completely different. It's not about design. It's about the mobilizing of what has been designed. And in that sense, I also, I mean, again, I could well get into trouble here, but I think the whole idea of sustainable design is pretty silly because um, it would focus on the kind of designed object and not the practice into which that object has a life. And so, can you design, who could design sustainable, actually what is sustainable practice becomes a, a big question. Um, actually, there are all kinds of institutions and areas of daily life that arguably use more energy than they have done before. But there you're looking at vast areas of daily life, you're looking at forms of kind of lock-in and interdependence and infrastructures and all the things that I briefly mentioned at the end. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I think the, the level has to be raised to that kind of broad trends in what constitutes everyday life. Like what is normal heating and cooling? These aren't topics. I mean, of course, that's full of designed objects, but it's not that alone. So I, I don't really think sustainable design is a very interesting topic. <laughs> Let, let me just uh, throw in a comment and say that I completely agree. And, and, that's, and that's the reason why I think that um, to address the issues of sustainability from a, from a history of design perspective, that we need uh, new ways of thinking about how to do design history. That you cannot longer you know, look at some object that designer claims is sustainable. And that's not interesting in that respect. You need to look at the systems and how this is part of a practice, of course. Okay, now it's time for our sustainability.